What you've just heard was a recreation of the final words spoken by pilot Fred Valentich before his plane disappeared up at Bass Strait. Even though it's been 19 years since Fred disappeared, the mystery surrounding what happened to him still hasn't faded. He just vanished without trace, and his family believed he was taken by an unidentified flying object. Recent years has been an explosion of UFO sightings in Australia. Whenever you mention the topic, people seem to have their own theories and opinions, or even their own stories. It was orange like a sunset, and it was just spanning across the road. I, I can't move it. Moving forward in time through the experience. Then this tall, dark being just appeared in front of the craft. And... I mean, it looks like a traditional, every day of the week, comic book flying saucer. They had large almond shaped eyes, small bodies, legs and arms, and, and sort of grey in appearance. I think it's the first time in my life that um, I could identify of anybody telling me that they were scared they were going to die. Saying that this thing was only just down the bottom of his street, you could see that it was out in the water, it was sucking up water. Yeah, I believe it's a UFO. There are between four and five hundred reports a month of UFOs in this country. Now obviously a lot of them can be explained, but about ten percent proved to be true mysteries. Tonight you'll hear from people who've had these experiences. They're just normal Australians who can't explain what they saw. I was travelling from Sydney in a northerly direction toward Gosford along this particular road here, the Pacific Highway, and um, I, it was quiet, there wasn't a lot of traffic, it was early Christmas morning, and uh, I was just gazing out of the, the front window of the car, and I saw approximately a half a kilometre away a, a bright silver, silver metallic object crossing from south to north. I stood here not believing my eyes because where I sit I can see the open water and I just couldn't believe that this thing could appear on the water. It was some kind of craft but it was completely surrounded in lights underneath and all around and it just looked like a carousel, it wasn't anything flat. Around holiday time the local police know they'll be busy but on this New Year's Eve the calls weren't what they expected. All people that I spoke to had exactly the same thing to say. There was no variance whatsoever in the object that was sighted. It was a huge chrome, very shiny object in the shape of a ball. At the bottom of the ball was a number of huge white lights. It, this object looked like it was sucking up water. Some calls were quite frightful in the voice. You can actually hear the fear, and in the background especially, uh, the fear of, of people and, of course, animals and things at the time that were experiencing this phenomena. We're looking out above this headland here, and we're watching a bright light move in a strange like, fashion that you'll never see, that, or we never saw anyway. That was moving quickly and moved, for instance, in a zigzag fashion. We were watching it for 10 to 15 minutes, move in this direction north, and we just saw this bright light, 15, 20 metres above our car, just a bright light, emanating light towards our car. Mate, it was just, it was just awesome. All of a sudden I saw these lights come out of the water like a, like a cylinder and flash and the top of the water was all lit up and as that light was up I could hear the rushing of water, movement of water and then the water being raised up and then shortly after down comes the water on top of the lake. I noticed this rather bright light that seemed to be on the right hand side of the car and it seemed to be following us for quite a while 
and then all of a sudden it turned and went at a right angle right across the expressway in front of the car. It was large, uh, round, and seemed to have a stream of sparks flying out the back of it. I don't know what it was, but it was most peculiar. After the initial New Year's Eve reports to police, the local Sun Weekly newspaper got hold of the story. There were hundreds more people at home that had obviously thought they'd seen uh, something quite out of the ordinary but hadn't, were too scared maybe to, to come forward and actually say that they'd seen something. Uh, our office, the day uh, the, the report uh, hit the streets, uh, was, was amazing. We had caller after caller saying they'd seen the same thing. A lot of the witnesses were retired academics, some were policemen, nurses, school teachers, Sunday school teachers, lawyers, uh, business people, some of the leading business people in the area. They were all people that had everything to lose and nothing to gain by coming, even coming forward and making a report. All the people who actually saw it hovering over the water described these four or five shafts of bright white light coming down to the water and literally penetrating the water rather than reflecting off it. We also had descriptions of the water seething underneath it. Some people said it frothed, some people said it foamed, some people said it was steaming up. Overall, I'd, I'd imagine there'd be probably three dozen telephone calls on the night. Well, we're pleased, aren't we? In particular, Sergeant Wenning remembers one very distressed caller. He told me he had been woken up from a deep sleep with thunderous noise and bright lights, dogs barking. His children had come into his bedroom screaming. He was saying that this thing was only just down the bottom of his street. He could see it was out in the water, it was sucking up water. The sound was like a million humming bees. He didn't know what was going on. We investigated officially with the local aircraft aerodromes, with the Air Force, with air traffic control, uh, and again could come up with no explanation. While everyone can describe what they saw, no one seems to have the answer to exactly what it was or where it came from. It was moving in, moving in ways in the sky which could only be described as a UFO. When you see something like this, there's a, a sure knowledge that you're looking at something that is beyond your experience. I'm not young, and people might think, oh, you're a bit strange, <laughs> seeing things and that, oh, imagine, had imagination. No, I've got imagination, but not like that. Not when I see something that I see, I know I saw it. At first I thought, well, maybe it's some type of meteorite, but it was too large, it was travelling too slow, and turned, turned a right angle, which... <laughs> I know meteorites aren't inclined to do. I was just bewildered at how something could appear and disappear in the thin air practically. Well, I honestly don't know what they saw. We've gone right through all the realm of possible explanations, which leaves it as what a UFO truly is, a flying object which we cannot identify by conventional means. There's a saying that seeing is believing, and it certainly applies to UFOs. The most intriguing personal accounts come from people with no real interest or belief, until it happens to them. Before this happened to me, I can be honest, I could say that I was in that category of being naive. I just, I didn't believe it. I didn't really believe it, because I had to see, it's like I would have to see it with my own eyes. Grace's experience starts in the early hours of the morning travelling home with three girlfriends. Victoria, who can't be identified, was one of the women in the back seat. It's when I got um, a bit further down the hill that I noticed on the right hand side of me some long oblong shaped lights. I didn't know what they were. I mean, I only sort of caught a glimpse of a bright orange light sort of shining through. As I got down the hillside and started to come around the corner by um, this little hotel that takes us back through the back roads towards the freeway, one of the girls in the back noticed a um, very bright white light with a type of blue haze around it. When the girls were sort of saying, oh, maybe, you know, like it's a, a UFO, and, um, you know, we sort of like just laughed it off and said, don't be so ridiculous. The women continue their trip, but further down the road, more lights appeared. 
I heard um, Victoria and one of the other girls in the back there, they were commenting on something that was behind us. They actually thought somebody was coming up behind us like a truck or something because it was moving fairly fast and very bright. It was just such a brightest blinding light. It was orange like a sunset and it was just spanning across the road. I, I got really scared and I said to Grace, quick, just step on it. I knew there was a town just a kilometre up the road. So as we uh, got closer in, like, into the middle of this car parking area and looked up, we could see this ship. Well, that's what you'd have to call it because it, it was, you know, definitely not an aeroplane and, um, and it, was, it was something from definitely not this world, that's for sure. It sort of moved across from this direction straight over the top of us. sort of disappeared in a, into a gully where we lost sight of it. We were scared for our safety. I mean, I, I've got to be honest, I think it's the first time in my life that um, I could identify of anybody telling me that they were scared they were going to die. Because I was. When I got to the opening of the drive here, the other girls noticed that um, there was something else up, some activity up there in the sky. We were still scared. We didn't know what they were either. They seemed to be moving in the direction that this, this, this other craft had gone over and gone down. So the first thing you think of, just pull up someone's driveway. And as I pulled in, the light was so blinding, it actually was hurting our eyes to look at it. Then I noticed a, a figure coming. It wasn't a human, it definitely was no human, that's for sure. I felt threatened by it. I felt really, really threatened by it. That was the closest thing I've ever experienced, the, th the thought of actually, you know, coming close to death, I suppose, which sounds pretty silly, but um, the fear that I had was like that. Like, I wasn't going to see my family again. And, and the weird thing is that it's, it's not the normal thing to talk about and for people to accept. But, um, you know, it's been three years now and, uh, and I still feel very distressed by it. In the weeks, um, I felt a lot of doubt that what happened to Grace. Uh, I didn't believe it, um, truly believed it because it ha I hadn't experienced anything that my, like that myself. So uh, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't show it either. I mean, I didn't show that I didn't believe it because I think it was important that, that I looked like I was supporting her so that otherwise, you know, she, you know, she might go sort of, you know, off the rails if, if she didn't feel she had some support from her husband. Okay. But two weeks later, those doubts disappeared. What you, uh, what's work? Late one night, they were both woken by the distressed 15-year-old son. He was dead set that he had presence in his room. You know, there was, there was somebody in his room. And um, one thing that uh, he did kept saying the time was that at that time was that can you hear that sound and he kept pointing up to the ceiling and um, we, we, we could hear and this low drone sound I knew then I'd heard that sound before we got back into bed and I was laying there and I thought do I lie here and just let this thing go through and just you know try and wipe it off as uh, another bad experience or do I actually get up and look and if it is what I think it is then maybe my husband will be able to see for the first time and he will believe. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. When you see, you see an object that's just sort of floating through the air like at slow pace and you think to yourself, oh my God, it struck me as you know being awesome and just something unbelievable. It was a relief that he was able to see this thing. And all I kept saying was that, that was the thing that was there the night when I was with the others. Certainly by its, by its nature, by the way, characteristics of the way it, um, it just hovered across the, the house at a slow pace, uh, yeah, no, nothing man-made. Not from this country, not from this earth, I should say. Even though Grace and her husband ended up experiencing the same craft, their ways of coping with it differ. 
Okay. You either accept it or you don't accept it. And I tend to say now, after I've seen it with my own eyes, I accept it. But I don't, you know, harp on about it and, and, and talk about it. And if it's, um, it's just one of those things you try and, and leave as a part of your life that's happened and let's get on with things, let's move on from here, you see. And that's how I sort of try and treat it rather than try and find an explanation as to what it is. Yeah, I really don't have a theory at that yet. It's basically, um, it's more the fear. Again, I don't know why, because I'm still here and I am healthy, you know, I mean, but the fact is it's, um, it's just a worry because um, you don't know. You just don't know. What do you reckon it is? Got no idea. Images of UFOs caught on video over the years tend to raise more questions than they answer. Ron, they are visitors. Yeah? Yes, yes. UFO. Working out whether there is something out there has intrigued researchers for years. And there's no doubt that there is a physical dimension to this UFO phenomenon and it appears to involve some form of um, technology uh, but, and many cases certainly suggest that we're dealing with, with an exotic technology that might be um, something certainly foreign to our environment. When a Melbourne photographer saw images like these, he was interested enough to go on standby to try and capture on film whatever was buzzing the sky over Narry Warren in June 1996. I got the phone call and I was told that the lights were spinning across the tree line over the homes. What I did was put the camera onto the object, allowing it just to come into frame, hit the shutter, count to 20, stop, wind, move the camera to the next part of the frame, start the shot, count to 20, let it go and so forth. Um, the first night, the result of the photographs showed just light trails of this object going across over the, the tree line. The second night, with high speed film and the high magnification lens, is where we actually captured the shot of the disc. This thing was... Uh, it, the only way to explain it was uh, it was moving across the air like, like ice on a, on a hot plate, very, very smooth. Later in the program, Doug's photos will be studied by an independent expert. Well, it was flying, it's unidentified, and it was definitely an object. Uh, what it will be, and I hope with the analysis, will, will prove me right. But yeah, I believe it's a UFO. In the UFO community, the term hypnotherapy is like a buzzword. It's the thing to try if you feel you have secrets of the past to unlock. While mainstream medicine doesn't necessarily recognise it, people who've had UFO encounters believe it helps. Victor Pufalescu believes he started having alien encounters as a teenager back in his native Romania. He's turned to hypnotherapy to try and find out exactly what happened. It's like being a good, good soldier. You just um, obey orders. This is actually the, probably the best description of uh, hypnosis process. Loosen limb, deeper sleep. Loosen limb, heavier and heavier. Not a worry, not a care. Deeper, deeper, and deeper. Hypnotherapy is a, a way of allowing us to get into the subconscious mind. The intellectual mind tends to want to control and criticise everything. It's, it's the sensor of stuff it doesn't even know about that was in there before we were three years old. So by sort of relaxing and sliding across the conscious mind if you like we can sort of delve into the unconscious or to allow what's in the unconscious to find its way out oh i can't move frank uh-huh i think the pressure is increasing i can't move the chest my arms uh-huh my legs there's a thing about hypnotherapy that very often the subject will want to please the hypnotist they have to look at that but um, the thing is that you can see that when a person is reliving an experience, that it's pretty it's easy right. to see whether that's faked yes, or I... not. Moving forward in time. My legs. Moving forward My in feet. time. Moving forward in time through the experience. The pain, well, the pain is inside of my elbow. 
Uh huh. Uh, thanks. Who are you saying thanks to? Them. Uh huh. Can you ask them what they're doing? No. It's a test. That's a test. I just know it's a test. Keep, they keep me telling me to be calm. They're telling you to be calm? Yeah. Uh -huh. Very often the people are, are quite disturbed about dreams they're having or things they've imagined happened to them. And they often come out of this saying, I'm pleased I'm not crazy or I'm not mad or I'm not imagining this. It does give you some um, answers, but also um, creates thousands more. And this is probably the trickiest part. I'm never happy with um, the answer which I, I, I'm getting, and I want more and more and more. Just relaxing as much as you can with every breath. Just feeling a sense of calm. From 1992, there was a very strong correlation with um, awakening psychically and with my healing work to having these experiences. Elizabeth Robinson is a spiritual healer and therapist who says she's been having extraterrestrial experiences since childhood, but is only now starting to accept them. I mean, when they started with me, I thought, my God, this is bizarre. You know, this is crazy. This is the, in the realm of science fiction. Um, but I know now I've had to work through that and struggle with it. And I've denied it like hell for five years. And I can't deny it anymore. Elizabeth says she started seeing creatures like these around her home in Perth in 1992. There were three beings standing there. They had large um, shaped heads, bigger at the top uh, to the chin at the bottom, large almond shaped eyes, small bodies, legs and arms and, and sort of grey in appearance. But they looked at me with a sense of intent and intelligence. Soon after, Elizabeth's daughter talked of being visited by a lady during the night. Elizabeth believes it was one of the same beings. And I looked down on the, the desk and here was a drawing um, of this being, the same being that I had seen. And I said to Jessica, who did that? Because I, I knew that at two and a half, her drawings were scribble drawings. And she said, oh, that's the lady. I tried to rationalise it, but I knew that I wasn't um, imagining this stuff. You know, there was something in me that told me that there was more to these experiences. Mm. They're looking at me again. Elizabeth then turned to hypnotherapy to try and uncover what she couldn't understand. This session was recorded last year with visiting American UFI researcher John Carpenter. Give the baby up. What seems to have come up in hypnosis is that I've had um, children taken from me, babies taken from me that are growing up um, on crafts. And this, this is just absolutely bizarre, you know, talking about this. I mean, it, it, you talk about this, but, you know, at first you struggle with it. I mean, you can't fully comprehend this, but what I could comprehend was the emotion around it. They tell me with their mind. The emotions are so real, they're raw, they're, you know, the grief is there, the, the terror is something like I've never felt before. They're just doing what they're doing. What are they doing? They're getting the equipment ready. Part of the reason why they're involved here on Earth is to help us awaken, but there seems to be some sort of reciprocal type of arrangement whereby, um, you know, they're, they're coming to Earth and they're um, creating a new uh, race of beings or creating some sort of hybrid race of beings. I used to think, OK, I'm dreaming, until I used to be able to get up, go to the bathroom, make a cup of tea, come back, sit down, they'd still be waiting for me. Yeah. And I think, oh... Mm. Um, Elizabeth and colleague Mary Rodwell now run a support group in Perth for people who've had alien experiences. And this is what I, I mean, my business is, is emotional trauma. 
That's why I'm here. And I won't deal with fantasy. I can't deal with fantasy. So it's about emotional trauma. These pe people are um, stressed quite desperately with fear and anxiety about a lot of things that they only have a vague idea often about, but often is because they've remembered being taken. I went three months with barely any sleep. If you remember, I told you about 11 mm. or 12 weeks, barely any sleep. Most of them just want to live an ordinary life. They don't want this to happen. So for them to have the chance to at least talk about it and release all the anxiety and fear around that as much as they can around talking about it, it seems that through that there is real healing. For me, I became very frightened that I would be labelled um, crazy or, you know, hallucinate, whatever it was, mm. and that I couldn't have somebody to relate this experience to that would honour my experience. Have either Elizabeth has always kept journals about her experiences, which she is now using to write a book. I saw a grey being appear, white grey colour. In the dream, I was searching for my son, even though the child dream of trying to run away from several grey beings, but as fast as I ran or wherever I went. I really don't expect someone to be able to say, absolutely, you know, this is real, because, you know, you always doubt yourself, but, but you know that it's real, and uh, you have to come to some point and stop denying it, and that's what I'm starting to do. Sorting out the facts surrounding UFOs can be tough. Unless, of course, there's something that science can put to the test. Earlier in the program, we saw photographs taken by Doug Page. The time exposure showed what Doug believes is a UFO hovering near his home in 1996. Now, has this been observed by other people as well? So, Practically all of Nary Warren. Okay, so that, that was seen, but not as a streak, because no. this is a time exposure. Just, uh, so it was flight. simply an object of some sort traveling Correct. Uh, in, in somewhat of a line, but as you can see, it, it goes is. up and down here. This type of negative sleeve will take... The professor would like to examine the negatives that come before and after the pictures in question. But Doug has used the ends of rolls of film and discarded the shots he felt didn't work. Now when the films were actually ready for handling, I'd lay them out and I went through them and I go with the scissors and I just go cut, cut, into the bin, cut, cut, put it there. And that's what I did. Okay. Um, after examining the camera the shots were taken with and checking density readings on the negatives, the next step is to enhance the images on the computer. I don't rely on computers for analysis. They some, they're, they're a bit of a tool. Uh, they sometimes let us see things a little bit better, but uh, to actually definitively say that a particular thing is something, I, I stay away from no, that. That's right. How did you focus the camera? Just on infinity. Okay, so if you focused on infinity, technically the tower should be sharper in focus than the tree. Should be, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting uh, question, isn't it's, it? It's a good one. The only trouble <laughs> is um, there's no sort of guarantee, of course, in the darkness that uh, the, it hasn't moved off set either. But I had that set for infinity. Okay. With some of the technical questions out of the way, it becomes an issue of individual perception. Very specific things here. I see a disc-shaped object. Mm -hmm. I see something with a rim. Okay, there is definitely a lip, there are what appears to be lights, there's big, there's another small one in between, another one. So we've got something that is geometrically laid out. You can see a texture, and you can see definitely on the dark side of it, something. So something's in shadow. I mean, it looks like a traditional, every day of the week, comic book flying saucer. My first impression of this when I saw it, again, was a, a trumpet, a circular object here. Uh, that we have a bell shape that comes out like so. This is uh, unexplained optical either artifact, phenomena, um, or reality, or reality, or could be you know could be an object. Uh, but it is totally un undefinable. And of technical concern is the fact that the start of the time exposure is more in focus than the end shape. Does it make any sense to you that if this was moving? and it's decelerating, would that have a, have a bearing on the, on, the, on the shape of the line? If it was slowing? Because no, I, it, I, it shouldn't. It should be exactly the same, same sharpness. 
despite question marks over issues like that, the professor is able to reach some conclusions. I don't believe that it's, it's been faked. Uh, I think it is probably something that was uh, traveling uh, through the air. Uh, what it would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know, and there's no indication from the photographs that would give me any, any clue. There are points there that I haven't considered, uh, such as uh, the object you know, could well be uh, a phenomenon that, uh, you know, that I've never heard of. You know, so, I mean, we've got to keep an open mind. I don't know, maybe between six and eight, I would assume. Okay. They were fairly intense? Or... Yeah, they were very close together as well. Right, okay. Four years ago, Kelly Carr was a mother and housewife with no interest in spaceships or aliens. Now she's using technology to reconstruct images of her own encounter. It does give the idea of the lights there, but you know, the, the brightness of the light, it gives a good impression, except that the colour doesn't seem right. Kelly's account starts in August 1993. My husband and I were driving up to my girlfriend's place uh, in Mombok, which is in the Dandenong Mountains. We were driving on Belgrave Hallam Road, and it was just on dusk. I saw what I thought was round orange lights in the field. It, it looked unusual to me. Later that night, retracing their route home, Kelly noticed something else unusual. It's about a, a kilometre or so in front of us, uh, about twice the height of the tre treetops, we could see this um, uh, uh, object, which at first I thought was a blimp. It had the shape of a blimp, but it was light. As we got closer to it, the, the light seemed to sort of separate, and it was actually these uh, a row of round lights, uh, and they were orange. It appeared like there was silhouettes standing in these round orange circles, like people, but you could only see the black outline. I just said to my husband, look, there's people in there. And the minute I said that, it shot off to the left of us. Within one or two seconds, it was gone completely. About a, a kilometre uh, or two further down the road, as we kept driving, I came across what, uh, at least what I thought, was a screen or a wall of light across the road. And my heart started racing, and the adrenaline was sort of pumping through my body, and I'm thinking, We've just seen this back down there. We're, we're in for, you know, a close encounter. Then the next instant, nothing. We seem to have um, actually covered a fair distance that I don't even remember covering. It might have been possibly close to a kilometre that I don't remember uh, actually travelling. <clears throat> there was no light. There was, you know, there was nothing blocking the road. Kelly says it wasn't until weeks later she remembered actually getting out of the car that night. And I saw that there was a, um, uh, another car that had pulled up 100 metres down the road. Then I walked around the front of the car to where my husband was standing on the other side and uh, we started walking across the road together. As we were walking across the road, I looked down and I saw that the other people were getting out of the car and starting to walk as well. So I was quite happy that there was other people there who were seeing the same thing that we were. And we walked up along here to, to um, where the fence is. Right out in front of us is this, this huge craft. I was totally awestruck, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was science fiction coming to life. There wasn't any fear then, it was just all total awe. We stood here I guess side by side, my husband and I, for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then this tall, dark being just appeared in front of the craft and, and he was followed by about another seven or eight that appeared straight behind him. I felt this energy go through me. It's like nothing I've never, ever experienced before in my life. It was like some sort of low-level frequency that came in waves but it was so dense that I could actually physically feel it going through my body and that feeling absolutely terrified me it was like uh, I can't even explain the horror that I felt just feeling this and um, I uh, began screaming the minute I did the eyes on these things lit up and they came charging across the field Halfway across, they split up into two groups. Some headed off down there, 
and the rest came directly towards us. I felt this blow to my stomach and the next thing you know, I'm back here somewhere on the grass. It literally lifted me off of my feet. And I thought I was going to die. I thought if I don't get up now, I'm never going to, I'm going to pass out and I'm going to die. I'm not going to come back to consciousness, you know. So I pulled myself up into a sitting position and when I sat up, I couldn't see anything. And uh, it was like there was just black in front of my eyes. I want you to try stretching it down a little bit as well. Kelly is not the only one who saw these images that night. For the first time ever, independent witnesses have given the same account of a close encounter. Even though Kelly has never met Jane, Glenda and Bill from the other car she saw, she has seen the sketches they drew for UFO researchers. They've drawn the same um, circles of light around the top of the craft with um, this, uh, these blue lines coming down, ending in a semi-circle uh, on the ground. They've actually also drawn a tripod underneath, which was something I didn't see that night. It comes very clear then that we were all looking at the same thing and that it wasn't your average um, saucer-shaped uh, craft. And basically, the second party were able to draw sketches of the beings very similar to the ones that I had, and they're not your usual... Um, little grey things that are, you know, media propaganda. I found a small red coloured uh, equilateral triangle underneath my navel, which I guess in reality provoked um, only a minor curiosity at the time. Uh, it was oddly geometric and I did, I did wonder, you know, how, how something like that could get on me uh, that looked like a burn without me feeling it. At UFO conferences where Kelly is now a keynote speaker, she adds strength to her own story by showing photographs of physical marks left on one of the other women. We were all left with triangular marks under our navels, but um, the ones that were marks that were actually photographed, the first one came from Glenda, which is a, uh, it's a series of three small red dots along the inner thigh. And both Jane and Glenda um, were marked with these dots. I wasn't. Glenda had a, uh, a ligature mark around her ankle, which is quite severe bruising. Um, it looked like she'd been strapped down to something. UFO researchers have also reported finding physical traces of the site where all witnesses said the encounter happened, particularly in relation to where the craft landed. Inside that semicircle was actually a, um, a triangular formation of three points spaced six metres apart, which correspond with the tripod that was um, drawn underneath the, the girl's craft. To this day, Kelly still doesn't know exactly what happened to her that night. Try, try a little bit. Her most vivid memory is the fear that she felt. That's very good. It's finally come out to what I'm looking for. And I think a lot of people, you know, might have experienced the fear in a nightmare where you're being chased or something like that, and it's a terror that you feel that, you know, sometimes can wake you up or whatever, but it's absolutely horrifying when you're dreaming it. And that's exactly what I was feeling while I was totally awake. That sort of terror, actually having to feel it while you're um, conscious and physically awake and feel it as a reality is um, like a living nightmare, like, like a nightmare that comes to life. We've moved out onto 138 acres. We don't have electricity. We use all our own fuel like for both our fires. We're in the process of trying to become self-sufficient as far as food's concerned. We just lead a, a, just a very different lifestyle. Denise Borat says it's her encounters with strange beings that have helped her make the decision to live this way. And I believe at the moment that they're giving us quite a dire warning about what's happening to the planet and what's going to happen to us unless we actually wake up to, to what we're actually doing. They seem to open parts of your mind that aren't open before and um, or they help you to do that. I, I don't know, but all I know is that I, I'm a very changed person since I've had my experience. Well, lifestyle changes, um, you'd think, shouldn't happen to people if these things aren't physically occurring. So I guess it's a little um, piece of evidence to suggest that something really startling and extraordinary must have happened to a person because of the changes that they do go through. 
The niece says her visitors have the ability to render her husband unconscious, so he never actually experiences the aliens, but he does have physical scars. Well, I know I've got a lot of scars on my body, uh, and I know basically where they all came from, um, but this one, in that particular place, I've got no idea. I just woke up one morning and I said, happened to comment to Denise, I've got this funny little mark on my arm, and she had a look and she had one in exactly the same place because she said she could remember it happening. Now I can actually remember them cutting it. Uh, I can remember it was like a little, like a little spatula or whatever. But again, there was no pain or anything. And the next day, mine had completely healed up, whereas Les's had actually scarred. And I thought, well, they're in identical spots and they're identical size, so obviously something was going on. People who've had multiple uh, abduction experiences very often get very concerned about the environment. Um, they get very concerned about uh, healthy lifestyles. They get very interested in the possibility of life elsewhere. They get very interested in, in promoting the message that there's something actually going on. If things do go haywire on the planet, like I believe they will, that we at least will be able to feed ourselves and not have to rely on man-made energy to, um, to keep ourselves going. It's pretty obvious that the people that have had these experiences are convinced there's more to what's out there than most of us realise. They're also the first to admit that their stories can be hard to accept. All they want us to do is be prepared to listen. I suppose people have got to make their own minds up, but we can honestly say that um, what happened happened and there's no doubt about that. Perhaps they're extraterrestrial, we don't know. Perhaps it's military experimentation. Perhaps there's new things in this earth that we don't know about. I don't know what they are. Um, I know what happened to me, but I don't know anything about them. Well, I'd have to say that it, it, the evidence seems to be fairly compelling. Uh, that we, we seem to have um, some sort of alien life form, just, just in what, what it is, you've got to keep an open mind. And since I've accepted it, I think um, I've really started to see it's, it's not really bad. There, there's a lot, in, a lot of good in what they're actually doing. And it's like they're saying to us, you know, human beings can do so much more. Um, we have these wonderful capacities to heal and to heal each other um, and to understand ourselves so much more. And, and we're not yet. Where they come from, I honestly don't know. I would hope that before I die, one day I find out.